what I began to see is that the day-to-day level of just loving my kid and making decisions for her that I would make for a, a kid who um, wasn't gay, um, that love looks the same in both those settings. You know, um, I, the decisions I was making for my daughter around uh, who to date and who to go out with and 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 that kind of stuff, like all the principles still applied. (laughs) Um, be good to each other, be careful, uh, guard your heart and make wise decisions. And I mean, all of those things still applied. And I, and I, I think that was one of the things that for me, and you talk about being in relationship with people when you're not in direct relationship with people who, who are different in a really fundamental way. Like in this case, Abby was it, it, she was attracted to people of the same sex. I'm attracted to people of the opposite sex, but fundamentally as human beings, uh, most everything else is the same about us. I wish for one more time to see the sun better days, a distant scene. Welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. I'm your host, John Williamson, and we are back with another new episode. Uh, Before we get to that, though, uh, a couple of housekeeping things as per usual. Uh, If you're new to the podcast, welcome. Uh, So glad that you found it and that you are here listening. Uh, If you've been around for a while, thank you for continuing to come back. I appreciate your support. Uh, For all things Deconstructionist Podcast, check out www.thedeconstructionist.com. There you can find our blog and uh, links to social media, links to our web store. And uh, if you want to support us through Patreon, uh, help help uh, with the upkeep costs of the podcast and the website and all that good stuff, uh, you can find a link to it from the website as well. Additionally, um, what else? Uh, I should probably give Clay some, some love. Uh, Forrest Clay uh, is the artist that you heard on the intro and will hear on the outro. So uh, Forrest Clay or... Um, our friend Clay, uh, he goes by Forrest Clay, but Clay has been nice enough to provide us with the theme music that you hear uh, on the podcast. So uh, for more information on his music, uh, you can see that in the show notes. Um, he's got a great EP out called Recover, the Recover EP. So go check it out. And I believe right around the time of this uh, podcast release, he should have a new song out uh, or at least soon. So check that out. And uh, uh, if you like his music and, and go and support him. Additionally, uh, please don't forget to uh, subscribe uh, so you don't miss a single new episode. And word of mouth is the biggest way that this podcast uh, finds new listeners. So uh, if you think it's helpful, uh, you like what what we're doing here, uh, please recommend us to a friend. Uh, that helps quite a bit. And uh, if you don't mind leaving us a five-star review on iTunes, that helps with exposure as well. So thank you. Without further ado, though, let's get to this week's guest. This week's guest is Stacy Frenis. She is a Christian music artist, speaker, author, and mom of an LGBTQ plus daughter. She's a former English teacher. She's turned her love of music into a, into a full-time vocation, forming her own publishing company and record label and landing multiple film and television placements. Uh, she and her husband make their home in the San Francisco Bay Area, and she just released a brand new book called Love Makes Room and Other Things I Learned When My Daughter Came Out. Uh, it's a very... Um, Very cool book. Um, I enjoyed reading it. It's uh, obviously from the perspective of um, of the mother. And so obviously we've talked a little bit about uh, LGBTQ plus um, issues in in prior episodes. And again, uh, you know, I will give the same kind of uh, um, precursor to this episode is um, obviously this is not meant to uh, cover all perspectives or certainly. you know, answer all questions, but, uh, it is one mother's perspective on what it was like for her, uh, to go through, um, a situation where her daughter came out to her and, uh, was initially, as she talks about in the podcast, a little hesitant based on their religious, uh, upbringing and their, uh, religious tradition at the time. And, and as a result, the love she had for her daughter, um, caused some cracks in the framework there and, made her um, reconsider some of the things that she had held um, as beliefs beforehand. So really neat uh, journey, really neat story and uh, um, fun conversation. So check it out. We'll have more uh, throughout the year 
uh, where we'll, we'll touch on some different perspectives um, as best we can. Uh, but hopefully you enjoy the conversation that we had. So without further ado, I give you Stacy Brennis. Go out and I swim towards the coast. Love of life. Spirit of All right, welcome to the Deconstructionist Podcast. Uh, I, I want to welcome my guest this week, Stacy Frenis. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, so, as we were talking about before uh, we started recording, I tend to get a lot of books for whatever reason. I don't know if publishers kind of plan it, uh, a huge release for the beginning of the year, but I tend to get inundated with books, and yours really kind of surfaced to the uh, to the top um, as just kind of a really interesting. Um, perspective and, and story. It's obviously very personal um, and, uh, and and one that I think a, a lot of people would be interested to hear. So um, before we dig into it, though, tell tell my listeners a little bit about yourself, kind of the work that you do and, and kind of your background. Sure. Uh, so I'm a, primarily a, a writer. I I'm, I'm, have been a singer-songwriter all of my life since I was a young teenager. Um, I have written and recorded about 10 or 11, um, music projects over the course of my career. Most of the music I've written about and shared with people has been, um, related to my faith and has been about my own spiritual journey and sharing that with others has been just a huge rewarding, um, not only career path for me, but, you know, ministry path as well. And, um, most of the, you know, I, I, as a young teenager, I, um, went to a young life meeting at a winter camp and I, um, you know, raised my hand when the invitation was given, if you wanted to accept Jesus into your heart. And so at 13 years old, I raised a shaky hand and walked forward down an aisle and, um, really began, um, a new, you know, exploration of, of my, of life in Christ as I knew it and understood it. And so around the same time that I discovered that God was, um, someone who wanted to have a personal relationship with me through Jesus was around the same time that I also discovered that I, um, had a musical gift that I could pick up the guitar and, you know, take, take a few lessons and learn how to play and play piano. And, and it was all kind of synonymous with like, um, these songs and poems I was beginning to write and that were kind of welling up in me as I was kind of just processing this new spiritual life I was growing inside of me. And, um, so a lot of my, um, self-discovery, God discovery, faith discovery, um, has, you know, been alongside writing about it in one form or another, um, usually in the form of music, but more recently in the form of also, um, books. So, um, I, yeah, recorded uh, music. And also I wanted to just mention that the, you know, most of the spaces that I've played my music in and shared my stories and, um, books in have been up until this point, maybe uh, up until maybe a couple years ago have been pretty much evangelical church spaces. You know, um, I actually, um, like I said, I, I came to Christ through young life ministry. And then, um, I attended an assembly of God church as a young person. And pretty much that was kind of my denomination for most of my formative years. And, um, even into my adult years, as I got into more like leading worship and, um, you know, getting involved in ministry and churches, it was always, um, assembly of God or, or, you know, Baptist or, um, non-denominational churches that were kind of tied to Christian reform or Calvary chapels or so very much in the evangelical conservative, you know, I would say space. So that's definitely been my background. Um, got married when I was 20, um, had two kids early on and, and, um, they're now in their early twenties. And, um, so I have continued to love writing and recording music kind of alongside, um, exploring 
my gifts as well as a writer, a book writer and an editor. So that's kind of me up to date <laughs> in a nutshell. Yeah. And I love, I love the story about kind of your, your faith journey. Um, it, it's, it's funny because you mentioned that, um, uh, as a child, uh, you kind of attended like Lutheran churches and it's funny cause I grew up as you know, in the Lutheran church, my dad's, uh, retired ELCA Lutheran okay. pastor. Um, and then my, uh, exposure to more like evangelical charismatic, uh, fundamentalist, even Christianity wasn't until I was in college. And so a lot of the terminology and, and kind of the form of worship was very foreign to me. And so, um, I've long been critical of kind of the more traditional uh, denominations in terms of, uh, you know, comparing and looking at the way in which some of these uh, uh, different streams of Christianity kind of, um, I, I hate to say market, but uh, in some ways that, that is true, uh, kind of market their brand of Christianity where what teenage kid is going to want to go to a stuffy church and listen to organ music for an hour? You know, like the theology up front doesn't matter how good the theology is if you know, if, if they don't feel a connection to kind of the presentation, which is where I think a lot of evangelical churches really, really thrive. Right. Agree. Yeah. And as someone who was a fledgling musician and songwriter, certainly that was appealing to me as well, the music aspect of church. Um, and, you know, as a child, me attending Lutheran churches, I grew up in Grand Forks, North Dakota, where almost everybody was Lutheran and Swedish, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, and church for us, for my family growing up, was kind of more around the major holidays. You know, it wasn't, there sure. wasn't really a relational yeah. kind of thing stressed about it. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's pretty pretty typical. You know, my dad and I have had conversations about that throughout the years. Like, how do we get the kids more involved? I'm like, well, dad, you got to adapt. You know, I think uh, a lot of these traditional denominations, Lutheran, Methodist, you know, uh, Presbyterian, a lot of these denominations have been around for generations, have been kind of slow to adapt to uh, kind of changing the way in which they present, you know, uh, church. Um, and again, regard it doesn't it doesn't matter initially. You know, there's no hook there. Uh, they're not going to stick around long enough to, to hear what you have to yeah. say if <laughs> they don't feel a connection there. Um, so talk about, you know, as you were growing up, sort of the before we get in, obviously, the meat of the book, uh, which really is largely a story about your daughter and your relationship with your daughter. Um, talk a little bit about the things that you were kind of taught, um, you know, growing up in, in more of an evangelical setting. What What kind of stage did that set for you in terms of how you kind of viewed the world? Sure. Um you know, I like the idea that um, our theology is kind of the the house we build for Jesus <laughs> is kind of a good metaphor, yeah, yeah. and I I that helps me to to visualize and also explain kind of the um, the framework, the belief system that I grew up with and that I sort of had built for me because through the teachings and belief systems of my faith upbringing. And I would say that kind of baseline was a, a very a, a pretty literal uh, understanding of, of biblical text. Um, I would also say that there was a very experiential kind of component to our faith. Um, you mentioned the music, you know, worship was a very experiential time. It wasn't a time where you just sat and, um, you know, observed what was going on. You definitely engaged with, with a real experiential, um, you know, active pursuing of God's presence in that, in those moments where you're worshiping. Um, and, you know, I would say for f just in general, I would say the Bible was very much in my life taught to be this, this answer book, uh, this manual for life that whatever was ailing you, whatever was troubling you, whatever um, questions you might have, the Bible would have answers for you. And not only would the Bible have answers, but but very specific, literal answers about how God works and acts in the lives of human beings. And, um, you know, I can remember... Uh, I went to a Bible college as a young person um, just out of high school, a very pretty fundamentalist Bible college. And uh, after two years of that, which was very 
it was very a, a comfortable move for me because of my own church that I'd been attending and kind of the type of teaching I'd been grown up with. But after that two years, um, I ended up just changing my situation, moving home, getting married. And I went to UC Berkeley. I live in Northern California and I continued my uh, English degree at UC Berkeley, which um, could not have been further <laughs> from, you know, a little culture shock. Oh my yeah. goodness. Just such a culture shock. And I can remember one of the first classes <laughs> I took as a, you know, an English major was uh, the Bible as literature. And mm. that class threw me for a loop because the, the professor was pointing out all these, you know, kind of ancient texts that were parallel, had parallel stories, parallel, uh, you know, whether it was a creation story or whether it was a flood story or whether it was an Adam and Eve story or, you know, there were all these parallels that were pointed out. And it was like my mind was going, you know, because... <laughs> All I could think about was this is heresy. This is this is absolute garbage. I mean, th this man has no understanding that the Bible is the only truth, the only way to God, the only actual um, you know text that contains stories of our origin. And um, so, at the time, I I could not like my brain just could not fit anything of what he was saying into this narrow sort of framework that I had grown up with it. I couldn't, I couldn't fathom that there wasn't a literal Adam and Eve, that there wasn't a literal Noah or Jonah or all of these stories I'd grown up with as literal truths, um, and actual stories, um, you know, on into the new Testament. Um, that was my framework. That was my, that was sort of the theological house that I had built around my relationship with God. Yeah. And I think, I, I think a lot of people listening are probably nodding their heads right now. Yep. Yep. That sounds pretty, pretty similar. Um, and so it, it sounds like, and I think for me, I had a very similar experience in college as well. I had a religion professor, believe it or not, who introduced me to Joseph Campbell, wow. yeah. uh, the famous mythologist. And Joseph Campbell, in turn, um, led me to um, his mentor, Otto Rank, mm. who, who talks about that very thing. He talks about um, this idea that, you know, the Moses story, for example, where we, you know, put the baby in the, the, the basket of reeds and, you know, and so, you know, uh, to say to save the baby and everything it had been told before in other older uh, religions. And I thought, w wait, what? what, you know, but, but understanding that, um, the people hearing these stories at the time would have understood that, that this is not a literal story. It's, it's meant to convey this, this message. And they would have understood that. I thought this is, this is completely new to me. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. So yeah, very, very interesting. So, so talk a little bit about, so you're obviously, you, you kind of have this uh, little seed planted in your mind in college, but not quite ready to hear that quite yet. So as you get a little older, obviously, as you mentioned, you had kids and, um, you know, I guess we can, we can kind of uh, move up to, uh, to the moment that probably really kind of fractured um, your, your, your paradigm there. What what had you been kind of taught leading up to this about specifically like homosexuality and LGBTQ plus sure. community? Yeah, what was what was that? Yeah, I would like? say you know because I live in Northern California, specifically the San Francisco Bay Area, um, I I have been exposed to the LGBTQ community um, most of my life, but it was it was in a very um, kind of um, narrow sort of almost. Um, you know, way that what I knew, I, I didn't have a lot of gay friends, um, because the circles I, I ran in and moved in were still very, uh, conservative Christian. And, um, so while I had a great exposure to, to the gay community in particular, uh, around the San Francisco area, um, I didn't have very many, people that I knew were gay that were out. And I, I certainly had, I could count on one hand, the number of friends that I, I had that were out and gay and my understanding of homosexuality just really was a, again, part of this very narrow framework. It was, it was limited to what the Bible said about 
homosexuality specifically. There's about seven passages or so uh, where the word is specifically mentioned, either the word homosexual or homosexuality. And my understanding was was a very simplistic one that that it was a sin. And that, you know, the friends that I, it was a sin like adultery or stealing. And the friends that I, I had were more kind of on the acquaintance level um, who, who were gay. Um, you know, I, I thought of them very compassionately as struggling with this condition, you know, that, mm-hmm. um, that pulled them toward this lifestyle that was, that was completely opposed to God. And while I had compassion for them and um, felt, you know, in some ways almost pity for them, um, I certainly could not conceive of um, a world in which they were, um, well, in my language, it would be, they were not, certainly not going to go to heaven um, because they were, quote, choosing a lifestyle that was um, walking away from God, not walking toward God. Yeah, I think I think a lot. Uh, even within the Lutheran tradition, um, as a child, I can remember it wasn't really something that was talked about frequently. Um, much in the same way as like your your concept of hell, it wasn't at the forefront of of what we were taught, but it was kind of in the background, kind of like, well, we all know this is this is bad, you know, um, but. We, we never really dove into it. And what's interesting is you talk about this towards, towards the end of the book, but you talk about, you know, the uh, six or seven references, potentially the, the so-called clobber verses. Mm-hmm. And um, when you actually look at them, yeah, you know, it's not so cut and clear and, you know, clear and dry, but additionally, regardless of how you interpret those verses, none of them reference anything resembling a, committed loving relationship it's always focused on the sex act right which we all know as adults like sex is certainly an important part of a relationship but that's not the entirety of a relationship a committed loving relationship that's just a piece of it but yet we focus on just that one component <laughs> right and beyond that if you if you dive in deeper there's there's a tone to the language and a connotation to the language that's very much about um, exploitive violent um, uh, you know, kind of um, specific sexual acts and not at all what, again, what we would, um, the terms we would use in a, in a monogamous loving relationship. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about this before. We had uh, Julie Rogers on, if, if you're familiar, who, yep. um, amazing, amazing story just from, from where she came from and kind of yes. uh, helping to, um, kind of undo some of the damage done by the kind of um, uh, um, is, the term is escaping, but, but, but kind of the uh, conversion therapeutic conversion attempts. Therapy. Yeah. Conversion yeah. therapy. Yeah. Yep. Um, very interesting. But yeah, we, we've talked about a little bit about, um, you know, the verses and, and how a lot of them, you know, probably reference ancient military practices mm-hmm. that's more akin to rape than right. it is to anything even resembling a relationship. But right. Um, uh, but anyway, so so obviously this affected you. You know, you, you mentioned that you didn't have a lot of like super close friends, and we talked. Uh, we've talked a lot on this podcast about how it's very easy to kind of dehumanize uh, an entire people group um, when you have distance between you, right. when you don't have a personal relationship with somebody. Uh, of a different people group. So it's very easy, for example, to, you know, dehumanize somebody who is a practicing Muslim. If you know nothing about uh, Islam and you don't have any friends who are practicing Muslims, it's very easy to do that. Um, but when you are in a relationship with someone, you actually love someone who is different than you and thinks differently than you, then it kind of changes the dynamic there. It makes it a little more difficult to kind of um, demonize them or to exclude them, you know, into that you know, outer circle of others. So, right. um, so talk about, talk about Abby, who is it, Abby? Uh, and, uh, talk about Abby a little bit. Sure. So, um, the events that happened in, that I talk about in this, in my book, love makes room happened about 10 years ago. Uh, when my daughter was a teenager, she was uh, a junior in high school. And, um, this was, it, it, 
in the midst of a time in our lives when there were a few kind of storms happening um, in our family life, um, there was just kind of some upheaval in our financial world. The housing market was crashing at the time. It was around 2010 <laughs> yep. or so, um, you know, minor things like that. Right. Um, and, <laughs> um, all that to say, uh, it was, it was an unexpected kind of, um, conversation that came up during a tumultuous time in our family life. And I was bringing my daughter to school one day and, uh, she was crying r really hard. She's, um, you know, 16 at the time. And it, it wasn't unusual for a 16 year old girl to be crying on the way to school. There was some, always some <laughs> drama or another happening. And, um, I figured there was trouble at school or trouble in a, in a, a, a relationship she was having or grades or any number of things. And I, I can remember just, uh, asking her question after question is, is there something going on here? Is there something going on there? And at one point in the conversation, she blurted out, if I tell you what's wrong, I have to tell you everything. And I remember that feeling mm. like a really unsettling kind of red flag, uh, in my mother's intuition, because I thought that's, that's not something you want to hear from a, your child who's crying and not telling you what's wrong. And of course I went to all these worst case scenarios in my mind and, um, and thinking, I think I think the furthest outer region of my fear was that she maybe was pregnant. And we pulled over and um I continued to try to nudge and talk with her and of course we had had a, a a good relationship and I think this is really something I stress in the book um to other parents is that um well I'll say first of all that the result of that conversation was was my daughter telling me that she was gay. And that she was terrified, uh, you know, I knew she was terrified to tell us just because of our family life and our family's faith and our, and just kind of all the things that we had, um, she, she knew that we kind of stood for and believed in, and she just felt fearful to fully expose and reveal who she was in that moment. And, um, and, um you know, in the moment, uh, thank God I had the, the presence of mind to say to her, I love you. I'll always love you. We'll get through this no matter what together. Um, but, but in my sort of, you know, soul in my stomach and in my head and all the places she couldn't see inside it, it, there was a lot of turmoil going on at that news. And there was a lot of, um, fear. Uh, there was, almost sheer terror on my part as a mother, because I, I suddenly realized that, um, I, I was faced with this kind of really horrific choice. And that is to, um, believe that, you know, the Bible was true in what it said about, about homosexuality or to actually, um, say maybe something's wrong with that belief because here standing in front of me, sitting in front of me, uh, is a perfectly healthy, whole, um, beautiful human being telling me that, uh, this is who she is. So th I think in that moment, I, I realized that something's got to give because both of these two ideals ideas are not going to fit in my narrow faith framework, you know? Yeah. And it's, it, it's so fortunate, though, that your reaction was was the way it was, because, you know, again, I think back to like Julie Rogers experience, who her mom uh, got very sick later on and, and likened the pain to um, I remember she described it as this pain is nothing compared to the pain that you've caused me by by being, you know, who you yeah. are. And so uh, I can only imagine kind of the isolation. I'm sure that your daughter felt for a time of feeling the need to have to keep that secret. Um as if that's not hard enough to right. go through that and kind of question your sexuality. And then you have the religious component as well, where we're talking about eternal damnation and things of that nature. Um, just the heavy burden that that must be. Um, so obviously this kind of starts to kind of uh, cause a crack, if you will, and, and kind of uh, probably made you second guess some of the things that you believe for so long. So talk about that process. Um, you know, and, and, and thank God your daughter felt comfortable enough in your relationship to 
to uh, to open up to you uh, about it. But uh, talk about the conversations that uh, that occurred afterwards and, and kind of your way of processing this and, and um, maybe even changing the way in which you looked at uh, this. Well, one of the reasons why I, I wanted to write this book is because at the time when my daughter first came out, um, one of my first thoughts was that I wanted to call a friend. I wanted to call someone and talk to them about it. Um, everything in our family life that felt like a crisis up to that point, I could call church friends and church friends would rally and church friends would pray and church friends would walk beside me in this road um, of understanding and, and coming to terms with this. Uh, this was this was an area where I did not know a single person in my church or even in my kind of more extended network of places I had sung for the last 20 years. I didn't know anybody who had a gay child and who uh, was open about it, talked about it. And I can remember just, she went to school the next day and I can remember sitting in my house alone and going, I don't even, I don't have a single human being to call and just say, mm. let's talk about this. Can we talk through this? Um, and, uh, so for me, the first kind of wave of questions was just around, um, is she going to be okay? You know, is this going to be okay? Both, both for her eternal soul. Yeah. And is she going to be okay? Just as a human being, who's going to take care of her? Who's going to, you know, because everything in my paradigm around relationships looked like a man and a woman, uh, you know, sort of a man taking care of a woman. It was a very traditional ethic around, around marriage. And, um, mm -hmm. and as, as I, began to just question what Abby's future looked like, what our future looked like together. I couldn't envision it. It it just was so confusing for me. I didn't understand how, um, how someone made a life this way. And so this was part of my, my questioning was how, how did this happen? Will she be okay? Uh, can God forgive her? Can God accept her? And these were questions that I, I literally went Googling. <laughs> and you can imagine just sort of the cesspool of information I fell into yeah. at that point. Because, um, yeah, uh, it, as it turned out, you know, I, I'm a researcher, I'm a reader. I do, yep. I do like that world of research, but it was also horrifying because you would, one day you'd think you'd find, um, you know, some wisdom and some insight and some science around X theory. And then the next day you'd find, you know, some, somebody who's really extremely opposed to that view and who says, this is what it's going on. And this is what we should believe. And this is what, um, science tells us or what have you. But, but in, in reality, you know, um, the more you read and dive in, especially if, if you, um, go outside of your denominational kind of, and and that's what we eventually have to do, right? Is that is that if we don't find the answers we're looking for in our small circles, uh, we have to go we have to go further out. And that's what I ended up doing. I mean, I, I went way ecumenical in my reading and discovered this whole world of God fearing, Jesus loving, Bible you know believing people and denominations and schools of thought that had already wrestled with this um, decades ago and who had come mm. to a, a really much more beautiful and balanced understanding of, of um, you know, LGBTQ people. And it, it helped me so much to just begin to pick up these breadcrumbs from other writers and thinkers and parents and um clergy who had wrestled with some of these things already. And, you know, um, I began reading, you know, uh, I, I remember picking up Justin Lee's book torn and, and Matthew yeah, Vine's yep. God of the gay Christian. And, um, uh, I read even some biographies of some other Christian artists who had come out years ago, Vicki Beeching, Jennifer Knapp. Um, I read, I mean, I read everything I could get my hands on. Then I began discovering folks like Pete Enns and Rob Bell and Richard Rohr and Sarah Bessie yeah. and Rachel Held Evans and kind of just this whole world of folks who were, who, as you mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, you know, ha have been having these discussions and exploring these areas of their faith. Because, you know, 
when when life sort of forces you to um, re-examine what you believe, it's 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 sort of like like you mentioned a crack. You know, that's a good way to put it because it wasn't just this one area where I was questioning the Bible and my beliefs. It was as though um, it was sort of a direct hit to my core, you know, because if, if, if those seven verses, for example, about homosexuality didn't say what I thought they had said all my life, then what else could I believe or not believe to be true in the Bible? And so it was this whole kind of Pandora's box that opened where, um, it, it sent me on this whole journey of saying, what do I believe and what is true? And, you know, is the Bible really this manual for living in this specific day to day to day, the way we pick up a car manual when something goes wrong and look for the answer of how to fix it? Or, or is it something else? Um, and uh, so th- and for me, on a very personal level, I I was still a mom, and I had a teenage daughter to raise, and I had very real pragmatic decisions to make. Like, could my daughter have friends sleep over? <laughs> could she um, go to prom with someone she really liked that was a girl? Um, I had to be making these sort of decisions day to day on the ground, right? Um, as a mom, and. And at the same time, I was wrestling in these really sort of upper level questions around eternal and meaning of life and meaning of faith uh, kind of thing. So I was sort of existing on these two levels. But but ultimately, I think what, what I began to see is that the day-to-day level of just loving my kid and making decisions for her that I would make for a, a kid who um, wasn't gay... Um, that love looks the same in both those settings. You know, um, I, the decisions I was making for my daughter around, uh, who to date and who to go out with and, and, and that kind of stuff, like all the principles still applied, <laughs> um, be good to each other, be careful, uh, guard your heart and make wise decisions. And I mean, all of those things still applied. And I, and I, I think that was one of the things that for me, and you talk about being in relationship with people when you're not in direct relationship with people who, who are different in a really fundamental way. Like in this case, Abby was, she was attracted to people of the same sex. I'm attracted to people of the opposite sex, but fundamentally as human beings, uh, most everything else is the same about us. And so when we are in relationship with, with people who have different skin color or different religion or different sexual orientation, it's like, those are the things we discover. It's like, oh, we are really so much the same here, you know? Um, and so I guess I was learning on two, on two parallel tracks. I was learning just humanity, what it, what, it's, what it looks like to just be a compassionate, kind human person to your child. Um, but also theologically, I think my, hum, my human lived experience was informing my theology at some point. It was saying, it was saying, this is what love is. Love, love, um, you know, as I went back to scripture and began looking at the words of Jesus, and I began looking at at motifs throughout the Old Testament and the out, you know, the New Testament, um, I began to see that the bigger picture um, was a very loving, forgiving God who continued to seek and pursue relationship with people, um, regardless of gender, skin color, orientation. Uh, whatever, you know, however you want to put labels around the things that we tend to draw lines and boxes and put people in, those did not seem to bother Jesus in, in the least. Um, and, and, and even in more overarching, um, God, you know, the God of love that I saw, that I saw sort of all the way through from the, you know, Genesis to revelation, um, seemed like such a bigger, more expansive, loving being than I had ever imagined God to be in this narrow framework of a belief system that I had grown up with. Yeah, that that reminds me 
you know, my dad uh, used to tell me all the time, uh, when it comes to pretty much any theological concept, he, he always would say, look, he goes, if it's not, if we believe in a God who is the God who, uh, who is the source of all love and an endless ocean of grace, then any concept that doesn't have an, uh, a foundation or isn't anchored in love probably is not of God. That's so you know? good. That's so good. Yeah. He's a, he's a wise guy. He's a wise ass too, but he's a wise guy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he'll appreciate it. Um, but yeah, it, and I, I thought, you know, that's so true because a lot of the ways in which we treat others, other human beings primarily around us and even the earth for that matter, uh, in a lot of ways we look at it, we take a step back and we're like, that's really not coming from a place of love at all. And all one has to do is take a look at nature or look at pictures from the, the Hubble space telescope. And you see that like clearly God as a creator delights in diversity. I mean, just look. Mm -hmm. And so why would that be any different when it comes to his human creation uh, in the sense that of course we fall on different points of the spectrum? Well, of course it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was, that was a revelation for me. I mean, believe it or not, it was something that I felt like I could apply that to, uh, I could apply that to most everything else, but sexual orientation. And that seems to be the, 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 you know, that's kind of the linchpin of a lot of arguments now about whether we move toward a more inclusive affirming stance in churches or whether we continue mm -hmm. to um, exclude LGBTQ folks from, from not just sitting at the table, but actually serving at the table, you know, of our churches. Yeah. It's, it's a very, um, it, it's a very deep seated and, and, you know, my, one of the things that I realized is that there are these really, really deep threads of personal bias and stereotyping um, that we are doing in these arenas that in some sometimes are strengthened and informed by our, our understanding of Bible, but, but many times we're acting, especially people from my generation, we are oftentimes it's this knee jerk um, kind of, reaction out of our own, out of the work we haven't done around our own biases. You know, uh, if you, yeah. as you said, you know, as we talked about, if, if you haven't been around people from a different faith background or people from a different cultural background, if you have not spent time with them and sat down with them at a table and talked to them, the, you can't help but put them into this sort of other category. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems like sexual orientation um, gender identity, these things, you know, these are hotbed issues right now where people are, are, I think, making decisions and policies out of such an ignorance, you know, um, yeah. as opposed to saying, let's sit down and talk about what does it really mean and feel like to be you in this world? Um, and, uh, you know, I think that goes so far. I can, one time I, <laughs> early in my process of understanding and trying to come to terms with my daughter, um, being gay was my, was a really, a really kind of skewed understanding I had of the LGBTQ community. Um, I didn't understand that these are just folks making their way through the world and, tr you know, trying to get a good job or f find someone they love and settle down with and trying to make meaning of their lives. And, um, you know, I had this idea from my growing up from my childhood that there was this sort of agenda around the LGBTQ community, the gay community, that they were trying to brainwash, you know, Christians to coming over to their side of looking at their alternate lifestyle that was godless. And, you know, just all of this, like, old tapes playing in my mind from things I had grown up with. And I can remember one time my daughter in invited me to come hear her sing at an open mic night. She's a musician as well. She's a songwriter. And, um, and I said, sure. And so uh, I, I came and it was only at the last minute that I realized it was a, it was an all pretty much mostly lesbian, um, bar that she had asked me. And she was only 19 at the time, but she was playing music at open mic nights. And I remember walking in there and going, I'm going to do this. I'm going to sit down at, you know, at a gay bar. And, and I mean, you know, it's funny because like, if you had told me this 10 years ago that I'd be sitting at a gay bar, I would have laughed and said, mm -hmm, right. But there I was, and I'm sure everything about 
the way I dressed and the way I looked screamed, you know, hetero Christian mom coming through. Um, but I sat <laughs> right. down and listened to her sing and sat with some of her friends. And my point is hearing them talk, you know, these were, these were all young women in their early twenties. They're talking about school. They're talking about relationships. They're talking about jobs. They're talking about all the things, all the normal things that any young community would be talking about. And as I sat there and just listened, I, it was it was so um, it, it was just so eye opening for me to understand that um, people are people, you know, people are human beings struggling with all the same things wherever we go, regardless of of these labels that we put on one another. Um, and and I think that uh, you know having a child come out as LGBTQ is is one of the greatest gifts a parent of faith can have because it absolutely expands not only your compassion for for humanity human beings but also it expands your point of view around god in this just like this incredibly um unprecedented kind of way if you walk through that if you take that invitation you know unfortunately again a lot of parents who grew up in my tradition, come from my tradition, reject their kids outright. Like you're talking about Julie's parents. You know, I get, I get direct messages and emails weekly from kids and young people who said, oh, I wish my mom had accepted who I was. I wish my mom could see me for who I am and not just for, um, you know, a trans person or a, a a lesbian or a gay person or what have you. Uh, so I know that there still needs to be conversation around this and we need to, we, I, one of the things my book is trying to do and I'm trying to do is normalize the process of moving from one belief to another. Like that was one of the things I searched for when I wrote the book was, or when I first, when my daughter first came out was where's some kind of story that shows me how you do this, how you get from point A to point B. Cause I saw people at point B, I saw people who were affirming and loving and inclusive and, but I didn't know how to get there. I didn't know how to cross the hurdles. I, and so I think first of all, just giving yourself permission to say, you know, as you're, first of all, I can change my beliefs. It doesn't mean God doesn't love me. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm thrown into the world of heretics now. I, I can change. That's part of maturing and growing up in our faith. Um, but also I can be in process and I don't have to have all the answers right this minute. It takes time. Yeah. And I'm sure, I'm sure that for your daughter, as she was processing all of this as well, I'm sure that, you know, she didn't expect you to go from point A to point B overnight, but just knowing that you you loved her unconditionally and and that had not changed was probably massively i would imagine helpful uh you know to to help her kind of say oh okay in, in terms of my relationship with my mother nothing has changed in that regard i'm still the same person i was you know uh, as you mentioned in the book you know it the biggest part piece of it at least initially seems to be kind of changing our expectations as parents because of course we all have i have an eight and a half year old daughter you know i i think Along the way, as a parent, you know, you realize you need to change and adjust based on their own unique personality and, and their own uh, desires and, and their own uh, joys in life. You know, I, I, I really wanted my daughter to be a soccer player. I love soccer. Mm -hmm. And she could not uh, care less <laughs> about <laughs> soccer or sports in general. And so I've had to adjust, you know, uh, not, not, not the best comparison there, but I, I admitted, but, um, but, you know, I've had to adjust my expectations in terms of what she wants in life and what she wants to do and the things that I can see bring her joy. And so art is her thing. And so trying to foster that and and um, and, and ensure that I'm feeding that uh, that joy and, and, and giving it life. So, yeah, you, you know, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah I'm glad you touched on that. you had to that. adjust a little. Thank you for asking mm -hmm. about that, because I, I do think that that's a, an area where parents in general struggle as their kids get older um, with these level of expectations. I think that there were a couple different kind of uh, levels that that worked for me. You know, one of them was just that I, I as I mentioned, 
my experience had been that I married a man and I was in a, a heterosexual relationship and that I had been married all these years and most of the relationships I had seen around me, that's what they looked like. So part mm -hmm. of part of envisioning a future for my daughter was envisioning a future that I had never seen before, that I had not imagined before for her. So it was a real right. reimagining of her life, her, her entire, um, her family life, what our family life would look like in years to come, what, um, how society might view her, uh, around that in years to come. Um, and then with that comes a, a real genuine grieving, a letting go of what I thought was going to happen, a letting go of what I wanted to happen. You know, there's a book in the, a chapter in my book where I talk about this, this wedding dress of mine that got packed away in the garage and, um, mm. in this beautifully sealed box, you know, because at the time that I had it sealed up, I thought one day my daughter will walk down the aisle in this dress. And it was, it was something that, you know, it was symbolic of course. And it was, it was, um, but it represented my dreams for her in, in so many different ways that I had carefully sealed and packed away. Um, and not really even recognized until, until it threatened to go away completely until, until that, that box got ripped open, if, if you will. And, and yeah. I had to, um, unpack the dreams that I, the specific dreams that I had for her and say, nope, that's probably not going to be how it looks. Um, but the beauty of that is that, is that once you kind of do some of that grieving work and letting go, that's what makes room to envision and receive and look for and welcome <laughs> and embrace, um, new dreams for your kids, you know? Um, yeah. I think that's a universal parent thing, like you said, whether it's wanting your kid to be a yeah. professional athlete or wanting them to be <laughs> um, in a, you know, heterosexual relationship versus versus same sex relationship. Um, those are very real things that I, I know that for me, I needed to grieve. And, and the other level for me was, was that in my line of work, it was singing and speaking in evangelical faith spaces like women's retreats and church services and conferences. And as I began to do this kind of musing out loud of my process around my daughter being gay, um, I noticed that that was causing a lot of uncomfortableness in my conversations with other Christians. And that I began to, um, two things happened. One is that the phones started to get quiet, if you will. My, the invitations stopped uh -huh. coming. Um, I can remember really hard conversations in which I was uninvited to come sing in, in places where, um, they had heard that I had a book coming out about my daughter being gay and, and my acceptance of that. So, so there was also a grieving that I had to do around kind of loss of community. Um, in a very real sense, I had, you know, long-term friendships and, um, professional colleagues who were pastors and ministry people, um, who no longer just understood where I was coming from and, and consequently didn't want to give me a stage as a ministry partner anymore. Um, because they fundamentally disagreed with my position. And that's been a really hard, hard grieving because I, I still have the same giftings. I still have the same, um, level of experience and professionalism and expertise in coming to whether it's play music or lead worship or lead a women's retreat. Um, but because of where I fall in this one area, um, I'm not welcome in those places anymore. And that's just a reality. And that, that, you know, that's something that, um, I've talked to many other people who are walking this journey, uh, not specifically around LGBTQ, but just around, um, well, the name of your podcast is deconstruction, right? The deconstructionist. <laughs> it's like, we all know what that feels like to kind of walk mm. into this wilderness and kind of leave behind this whole faith community that just doesn't want to join us uh, as we move forward. Yeah, it can it, it can obviously feel very isolating. Um, 
you know, regardless of what what kind of idea you're leaving behind in in your former life of faith, and yeah. um, you know, I, I think more often than not, the majority of like the emails we get and and the people reaching out and the people we get a chance to talk to, um, nine times out of ten, it's about just the feeling of that loss of community, mm-hmm. and um, and it's never it's never by choice, you know. I think, you know, especially when you've grown up in it and you've, you've been around these people in this community for so long yes, and yes. they've seen you through major life events, but then suddenly you're no longer welcome. Right. Um, and, and you don't know where to go. And community is such a huge, important part of it, just being human, you know, we're, we're made to be communal. And so it, what you just said just kind of made me think in, in the story in the book, um, of, of you going to the lesbian bar made me think of, um, uh, I got to recently speak with Jonathan Martin, and he talks about just how occasionally in life, especially when it comes to reli- religion, religious trauma, you know, that safe space or that space that we thought was safe for so long, whether it's the sanctuary of the church or, you know, that sort of thing, uh, when it suddenly is no longer safe. Yes. You know, wh- how do you find a new sanctuary? And, I thought about that when it come came to your your daughter going to play music at a lesbian bar. I'm sure gay bars in and of themselves were not, um, you know, created just to have a, a, a bar for like minded people. I'm sure it was born out of necessity. Yes. Like they were largely ostracized yes. and not welcome uh, in other places, and so um, they've in a sense created a, a safe place, a safe sanctuary where they can go and and not be ostracized and not be criticized uh, for being who they are. And so um, there's a parallel there I see mm-hmm. with with your daughter and with you where you've had to uh, come out of what you thought was a safe space and find sanctuary elsewhere. So talk a little bit about also like how how did that affect obviously your your church community and because mm-hmm. you know you said you attended uh, you had a home church there for a while and and obviously probably didn't align. <laughs> uh, on this particular topic, so so has that affected your your church life on a on a personal level outside of creating music? It has, and this is the this is the part of when I talk about the book and when I when I talk about kind of the the journey or the process, if you will, that still feels really messy to me. It still feels really mm. um, un unresolved, and um, because. For a while, I I kept going. My husband and I kept going to our church. Um, as I said, we we were worship leaders, and then also I made my living um, playing music for other churches. And so there was this kind of almost a duality that was happening in my heart, where I was showing up in these spaces to to perform a, a task, a ministry, but also a job and get paid for it. And I was having to make decisions. Uh, you know whether or not to continue doing that. And also as, as the invitations dried up, that became clear that that was not going to be a really viable career path anymore. Um, but around the personal worship side of things, the personal actual home church, um, it was, it was a painful thing because we, we discovered, um, early on that, uh, you know, yeah, our church leadership did not align with where we were, where we were going. And, we, um, for a while we were hoping we could still make that work and still maintain friendships and relationships and with those people. Um, and, and outside of church, there have been folks that have continued with us on this journey, have continued being our friends, have continued asking the same questions we're asking and having conversations. And, um, but there've been, I'd say the majority of them, um, just got very quiet once we stopped kind of showing up at church. Um, and we, you know, I talk about safe sanctuary. I, I can remember one of the final times I was in church. I can remember, um, this was of course, you know, COVID hit, this was pre pandemic. Um, and since pandemic, I haven't been back to my home church, but before COVID, um, even before COVID, there was probably a year or so that I, I just wasn't attending. But one of the last times I stood in church, I can remember, and maybe some of your listeners have had this feeling, but there was a worship song playing and the rock band was on stage and everybody's hands were raised and singing some lyrics and, you know, close, you know, 
like standing close, you know, shoulder to shoulder with people in your row. And I remember thinking so clearly that, that the people with whom I was standing in this row would, would probably not, uh, would probably not have the same, um, they would not pray the same prayers for safety and happiness and a flourishing life for my child that they would pray for their own child. They would not, they would not even actually want or envision or believe that my child was worthy of finding love or of flourishing in, in all of the ways that their child should be able to flourish, their heterosexual child. And I can remember that for me that day, that was a, that was a deal breaker. Like I couldn't, I could not um, stand in solidarity with those folks any longer. I couldn't, I didn't feel welcomed or safe. And I certainly didn't feel like my daughter was safe in those spaces anymore. Um, and so since then we've, um, you know, we, we've just been, we've been attending a, an online kind of a situation where, mm -hmm. um, we know the people and that, it's, it's a small church actually in St. Paul, Minnesota. That's just very, it's called grace place. And they've just have kind of healed our hearts in many ways, um, because they preach mm. grace, 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 and that's about it. And it's a, it's an affirming, um, Jesus centered, love centered kind of, um, teaching and message. Um, as far as, you know, the church as an institution, uh, some days I feel hopeful around, um, because I know that, that in, in a very larger sense, there are a lot of denominations who are in a good place with LGBTQ folks, but there's also, I think the evangelical world ha has yet to do the work and, and, and may, may never do the work. Uh, and I don't know exactly what the evangelical world really ha holds in terms of their future, but, um, it doesn't look super hopeful, but I, I am convinced because of private conversations and private messages and kind of under the radar conversations that I'm having with people that people's hearts are changing. People's hearts are opening to the LGBTQ community. Uh, conversations like this are happening and I think we are moving forward however slowly. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, I, I've had some recent conversations about church and specifically the LGBTQ community and, and just how the church has kind of done a mass, not kind of, has done a mis, uh, giant misservice to to that entire community. And um, as you mentioned, you know, you talked about the fact that people who maybe are same sex attracted are are going through the same human struggles that we are. Yeah. And it's not that they didn't want to go to church. They didn't feel welcome at church and for good reason. Right. And, uh, and, and so we're kind of playing catch up in a lot of ways. And, but I have been, I have been very hopeful because as you said, there, uh, not all churches are the same and there are churches out there who are doing some good work. And, and, uh, you know, I, I went for the first time as you, uh, as you mentioned, I, I hadn't gone to church for a while, you know, partly due to the pandemic, but, uh, went for the first time, uh, Easter Sunday and, uh, and was surprised in, in a good way, um, at just, um, how open and accepting the church was that I went to and it happened to be at, um, ELCA Lutheran church, which is probably the more progressive branch, right. um, for lack of a better word, but they are fully affirming. And in fact, um, one of the first little videos that popped up while we were sitting, waiting for the service to start was they had a class that they were hosting, uh, in conjunction with a local LGBTQ, um, organization to explain to anybody who wanted to come what the, what the, the letters actually mean wow. and uh and and and, talk, and educate people um on, on what that actually means and i thought I love, wow. wow that's love that <laughs> yeah and then communion rolls around and they said look you know we believe that all are welcome to the table regardless of your background or your beliefs or whatever you know god's grace is is well you know is is available for for everyone man i love that and uh yeah and that's really you know it goes back to what you were talking about earlier it's just you know we need a bigger table. Mm -hmm. We need, you know, and, and we should not be the ones uh, in charge. Like it's some sort of exclusive club uh, in regards to who gets to sit at the table and who doesn't. Cause Jesus didn't do that. <laughs> you right. know, 
Right. You know, Jesus was hanging out with the least of these. And these are the people that largely we are shunning and we're not being loving and we're not being, uh, we're not extending grace. You know, like it makes me think of um, uh, poor Joel Osteen, you know. Mm. uh, (laughs) Yeah. When... When when the levees broke and he has the opportunity to open his doors and welcome people in and use use uh, this facility that that uh, you know could have provided uh, shelter and and didn't at least initially it's like what are we doing yeah you know but you know uh, all that to say again I I am hopeful because I do see churches and not just within Lutheran Church there's Methodist churches right. now that are fully affirming there's Episcopalian churches that are fully affirming. And it really comes down to that individual church, regardless of denomination, um, in regards to how they how how they extend love and and that sort of thing. It so really it is, does. It's and it's interesting. Yeah. It's kind of the wild west. I mean, there's the. It's like yeah. Every like you said, every church for themselves, and that's why I think, um, you know, if I can toot my book's horn for a second, and Ju- you know, people Do like yeah. Julie, like <laughs> those of us who who are writing our stories out and getting them out to people, I think, you know, that's what. I think that's what makes a difference is just people Mm. talking to people about real life and real human processes around changing our minds and um, moving toward a more, a a more loving, honestly, a more loving body of Christ. That's, that is the goal, you know? Um, Yeah. So absolutely. And I love that what you're doing. I think that that's such a crucial piece of it all is just a safe place to ask questions, to talk through things that maybe don't feel safe to talk about at church or at Bible study. But the thing I keep coming back to is that, you know, sitting in our pews, sitting in our church choirs, sitting in our Bible studies, sitting in our home groups are either parents of gay kids, you know, LGBTQ kids Mm -hmm. or LGBTQ folks themselves who have not yet felt safe enough to come out. And until that happens, we, we have to continue, truly continue, um, actively trying to make these spaces more safe. Absolutely. And, and I mean, there's a reason that the suicide rate is so incredibly high for, for young, um, LGBTQ, uh, kids. From religious families, it goes even higher when you talk about religious families. Yeah. Which is, Absolutely devastating. We have to do better. Yes, we, just we have do. To. We do. Well, I appreciate the work you're doing. Uh, before I let you go, I know one of the big things that you talk about are resources, which I think you mentioned you felt like there were a real lack of resources initially. So what are some of the resources that were helpful for you that people listening can go and check out? Great. I'm so glad you asked that. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned a couple of books, um, uh, Unclobber by Colby Martin uh, is probably just the Honestly, it's such a great book because it's so readable, so easily accessible, and he he hits all the major scriptures. Um, there are for parents, I would say there's a couple different things. One is called Embracing the Journey. It's a husband and wife couple whose whose sole work in life is to kind of walk Christian parents through the process of their children coming out, embracing the journey. They're out of Atlanta, uh, but they're they have a web presence. Um There's also um, Centerpiece, uh, P-E-A-C-E. Centerpiece is also a nonprofit organization that works directly with Christian parents and LGBTQ. Um, A parents organization, Centerpiece is one. And then also um, Freed Hearts, uh, Susan Cottrell and Robert Cottrell, freedhearts.org is another parent organization that um, really has lots of good resources to help educate parents around this, this topic. Um, yeah, there, I feel like I could go on, but those are three good ones. Awesome. I will definitely, um, add those to the show notes. And so where can people go to stay up on top of, uh, what you're up to and, um, and get a copy of the book? Sure. So love makes room is the name of the book and it's out in both uh, paperback form and audio book format. So they can go to, to get it on audible or iBooks or anywhere. Um, Stacy Frenis is my handle on all the socials. So Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, just at Stacy Frenis. Um, and, and my website, Stacy has, has any resources or books or music that I'm, I'm working on as well. So thanks for asking that. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, folks. Go ahead and grab it. Uh, Love Makes Room and Other Things I Learned When My Daughter Came Out uh, is out now. So grab a copy, uh, check it out. And uh, if you're part of the book club, you might just see a copy coming uh, soon. So thank you so much, uh, Stacey. I really appreciate it. This is a really uh, fun conversation and an important conversation to have. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. John was young and driven with a heart of gold Finished seminary, married, found a church he could call home Made a living, giving, dying folks a shoulder and a hand Until he told his lead that he had some feelings for another man and they said John you must go and take your broken heart and walk it to the door we know you
And he said, child.